thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me, and uh, I very much enjoy the um, discussion this afternoon uh, about um, political, um, what is a, the appropriate political course to take in uh, Europe. I need to uh, take my watch out. I'm programmed to speak 45 minutes. Uh, I think it's sort of genetic, actually. But uh, the uh, still, I watch the. I think watching my watch uh, 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 helps. So I might, uh, because I was asked to speak for an hour, I might try to struggle and go past 45 minutes and pad it out a little bit. Um, but more time for questions if there are any. So I found it very interesting the political discussion. And I'll try to be a, a policy oriented uh, today, and I have two points to make. Two fairly. Um, uh, a simple point. Uh, one is that the deficit debt crisis in Europe is a fraud. It is a scam. It is a misrepresentation. Um, the, uh, it is a lie. Uh, I think the technical word is the word bullshit. Uh, it is a misrepresentation that has been extremely successful. So that's the first point I'm going to demonstrate, that it has no basis in economic, it has no underpinnings, it has no material basis. Capitalism certainly has problems. But there was no reason that those problems had to manifest themselves now in a Euro crisis. That's the first point I'll make. Second point uh, that I'll uh, deal with is why then? Why was this particular fraud perpetrated at the time uh, it was? And um, the, uh, how do we account for that? Because it's not enough to say it's all just a scam. Uh, we have to explain why uh, someone would carry out that scam at this moment and why most people would believe it and why most people almost across the board would believe it. So on the right wing, everyone believes that there's a fiscal crisis in just about every country of Europe. And on the left, everyone believes there's a fiscal crisis, but that it's the capitalist fault. Uh, so I'm going to explain why, and explain why will require an excursion into uh, Marx's theory of finance, <coughs> which will reveal to us why <coughs> this particular um, uh, scam is being perpetrated now. If you want to read, um, uh, I'm going to be clear, I'm not suggesting that you would want to read uh, what I've written about that, but if you did want to read, uh, that you should go to my web page, which is very simple, jweeks.org, where these things will be posted. And one thing that might induce you to go there is when I return on Sunday, on Monday or Tuesday, I'll write an article and put it up on my web page about this meeting, uh, which will be free, uh, free to uh, distribute uh, if you uh, wish. How many people here, I'm just curious, study economics? <laughs> a few, okay, well, uh, I need to explain. There are a couple of concepts I need to explain. When people talk about debt and talk about deficits, particularly public debt and public deficits, these are not straightforward concepts. It's not that they're complicated, it's that they're so easily misrepresented. And the first thing one has to understand is that when it comes to the public debt, there's a difference between the gross debt and the net debt. And this is not some arcane or obscure idea, <coughs> uh, you know, in the, uh, deep in the bowels of some economics books. It's very straightforward. I'll take the example of Norway. If you go to the European online, to the European statistics, it's called uh, Eurostat, or if you go to the OECD, it's called OECD stat, strangely enough. And, uh, and you look up the debt, 
you'll discover both of these measures. And the difference between them is um, uh, can be illustrated by the case of Norway. Norway's might say the, the borrowing by the Norwegian government is about 58% of GNP at the moment. Norway, the government of Norway, for the people of Norway, hold assets in an oil fund equal to 210% of GNP. Therefore, the net debt of Norway is not 58%, it's minus 148% of GNP. And the same principle, not quite so striking, applies to every country, as we'll see. And the difference is made up of the foreign exchange uh, reserves that a government holds, the, uh, the, the cash it holds in various accounts, and um, uh, other holdings. Uh, another example, which isn't so relevant for Europe, is people will say that the United States has a public debt of 100% of GNP. That's complete rubbish. 42% of the public debt of the United States is held by American public agencies. So that is, <coughs> that's, it's, owed to the, it's owed to the United States itself. The biggest single one of those is the U.S. Social Security Fund. So the net debt of, uh, of the United, it's not even the net debt, the, the part of the U.S. debt which is held by somebody other than the U.S. government is considerably, is, is less than 60% of GNP. And several percentage points of that are held by state and local governments, which are unlikely to speculate on them and are unlikely to go to four curls. So you're down to about 50% of GNP. So, all of, so it's very important the way you measure it. Uh, deficits. This, I think, uh, is probably the, if, if the way the debt's put forward, you know, and said the, the, uh, Britain has a, uh, has a deficit equal to 100% of GNP, when actually, as we'll see, the net debt is much uh, less than that. What's said about deficits is even more of a scam. There are at least three relevant deficits. One is called the overall deficit, and that's com common what you would think it would be. That's what the government spends in any time period uh, <coughs> and, uh, compared to uh, the revenue uh, it receives. However, no one, no agency, no rating agency, nor the IMF uses that measure to judge the fiscal health of a government. They use something called the primary deficit. So if you go to the IMF, which is the most notorious enforcer, well, now it's fallen in second place after the European Union, used to be the most notorious enforcer of uh, good, quote, sound fiscal policy, they use something called the primary deficit. And the primary deficit takes out interest payments on the government debt. There's a very sound reason for this. A government cannot stop paying, it can't cut its interest payments without defaulting on its debt. So they're always taken out. If you're looking at the, the part of the deficit, and you're, you know, you're, you're obsessed with reducing the deficit, you take out the interest payments. Many countries uh, in the world, I doubt that Slovenia is one of them, and Britain is not uh, one of them, have a rule, as it used to be called the golden rule, and that is that when the government invests, when it builds a road, it should fund that with borrowing. It should not fund it with current revenue. There's a very good reason for that. It's the same reason that businesses, if a business is going to put up a building or to put up a new factory, it doesn't pay for that out of its current revenue, it borrows to pay for it. It either borrows on money markets or it borrows from itself, from its uh, accumulated uh, past funds. And the reason for that, of course, is the investment project is supposed to pay for itself over time. It's supposed to generate 
flow of revenue, income to the business, which will pay for it. So if you were to pay for it, if a business were to pay for it out of current revenue, it would pay for it twice. It would pay for it the first time, and then it would pay for it the second time when flow of revenue. And it's completely rational to do that. And that's why business is going to debt. Well, the same principle should apply to governments. And, the, and that back in when economics was not so reactionary, when you took economics, that's what you were taught. That the government is supposed to cover its current expenditures with revenue, taxes, that's uh, uh, <coughs> current, the wages and salaries are the most important thing, uh, but you know, uh, computer paper and uh, things such as, uh, uh, such as that. And the, their investments, they're supposed to borrow to cover. The only exception to that is if the economy is very close to full employment and it is in danger of overheating, then you should not borrow to pay for your, uh, uh, <coughs> for your investments. But that's not because it's a bad thing to borrow to do it. It's because you don't want to add to the aggregate demand of the economy. OK, having made those points, I can forge ahead. Italy, I'm going to talk about three countries, Italy, Spain, and uh, the United Kingdom, two countries in the Eurozone and one outside. The story of Italy, you might call it the Italian job, though most of you here are too far too young to remember the film of that name with Michael Caine. Uh, <clears throat> the Italian job is in the 1990s, the early 1990s and through the 1990s, the Italian government borrowed at very high interest rates for the purpose of maintaining the value of the lira compared to the mark in order to enter the euro. I guess this is the case of be careful of what you want because you might get it. And so they were borrowing in order to protect uh, uh, the lira in order to join the euro at the end of the decade. Here is a graph that shows two things. One, <coughs> the lighter line shows the borrowing rate of the Italian government over a period of about 20 years. And if you have a look at it, you will discover that the borrowing rates of the Italian government now are much, much less than they were in the 1990s. They're about a third of what they were in the 1990s. So this terrible five and a half, six percent that the Italian government is borrowing at is far, far below its borrowing rate in the 1990s. <coughs> There's no objective reason why one should consider the current borrowing rate of the Italian government to be high. Because it's it's pretty short history, it's low. Now not it should, you should not be astonished to discover that if the borrowing rate has come down, then the interest that the Italian government is paying on its debt must also come down. So far from being burdened with a heavy interest payment that it can't make, the Italian government, Italian public sector, is faced with a situation in which it is much easier to service its debt now than it was 20 years ago. <coughs> I can show that in another way. Here we have the Italian public debt and the, um, uh, the interest share on it at the top. And, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, <coughs> That's what's called a senior moment in the United States. And so let's uh, uh, step back. This is the Italian deficit. So <laughs> is the Italian deficit a problem? There are scams. You know, there, uh, there's, a, um, uh, 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 there's a Yiddish word. Uh, it's called uh, it's chutzpah. Uh, it means, an uh, example of chutzpah is a child murders his mother and father and then when he's convicted before the judge, he pleads for mercy because he's an orphan. <laughs> the chutzpah, in Italy's case, 
is a suggestion that they have a, de a, a deficit problem, that the fiscal deficit is a problem. In fact, Italy is the only country in the European Union that have a positive primary deficit throughout the 1990s and the 2000s up until the crisis. So far from being a deficit-ridden country, we all know Italians, perhaps Slovenians too, if Italians they, just, they don't like to work, they like to just sit around in cafes and drink wine and have fun and, they, and, their, and their government spend an outrageous amount of money and that's why we have this problem. Well, actually, Italy's primary def uh, deficit was positive, it was a primary surplus, and it was larger than Germany's. Now we need a little, for this rather strange looking diagram, we need a little bit of economics. I should be fairly clear that uh, the deficit of a country is a balance between the revenue, I mean, by definition, between the revenue that is, is spent, the expenditures and the revenue that is brought in. Most of the revenue is generated through income taxes and sales taxes. Income taxes and sales taxes expand and contract as the economy expands and contracts. So as income goes up, revenues rise, as income goes down, revenue declines. That means that if your expenditures weren't changing, then when the economy is expanding, the deficit should contract. <clears throat> And when the economy is contracting, the deficit should expand. It's not only because revenues decline when there's a recession, when the economy is contracting, it's also that uh, governments spend more on unemployment compensation, uh, more people claim disability benefits, uh, and you have to pay more money in uh, uh, programs such as um, uh, uh, food support for families which uh, uh, don't receive unemployment compensation, other welfare programs. Therefore, the growth rate of an economy is, should be correlated with changes in the deficit. So in the growth rate, you have a growth rate of 3%, you should have a decline in the uh, deficit of, in, let's say, two percentage points, or <clears throat> depending on the uh, tax structure. And when the economy contracts, the economy, uh, the um, deficit should increase. And that's what this diagram shows. Uh, if you want, if it isn't obvious to you, it shows a positive relationship between the rate of growth uh, of the economy, which is on the horizontal axis, and the um, uh, changes in the deficit, which is on the vertical axis. And the exact relationship is about, for Italy, is about uh, 0.4. Uh, you can explain about 40% about of changes in Italy's deficit are explained by changes in the rate of growth. The other 60% would be explained by changes in things like uh, increases and decreases in comp uh, unemployment compensation, changes in expenditure, changes in taxes. Okay, finally, the final point to make on the, um, uh, Italy is <clears throat> the public debt burden. In constant prices, the Italian debt is hardly any larger now than it was 20 years ago. That is, this burgeoning debt problem of Italy hasn't burgeoned very rapidly. Because in um, 2011, the current value of the debt was about uh, 2 um, 
trillion uh, euro. Uh, and that was up about 10% uh, from 20 years before. But if you look at it in constant prices, the, uh, the change was, is less than 5%. It's a fairly slow rate of growth. And the real burden of any country's debt is the interest burden, and that is the two bottom lines. And what they show is that it's almost been continuously declining through, as we should know from the earlier discussion of interest rates. Okay, so how do we summarize the Italian job? What happened in Italy's case is that in the year 2000, it had a slight positive trade balance with Germany. At the end of the 1990s, the Schroeder government, the Social Democratic government of Germany, convinced the trade union leaders to accept a, wage, a real wage freeze. The idea was to make German exports more competitive. In addition, the German government introduced a tax holiday for payroll taxes on exports. So therefore any taxes on uh, things like what would in uh, uh, the United States, what would be called social security payments and in, uh, in Britain, uh, uh, unemployment uh, 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 taxes and also um, the taxes that cover the uh, National Health Service. Uh, the, uh, the German government suspended those for anything you exported. And they, may, and they also suspended VAT for anything you exported. Ten years later, Italy has a very large deficit with Germany. And as someone was saying this morning, talking about uh, uh, Greece, that trade deficit was financed by borrowing from German banks. Okay, so the story is Italy is uh, one of beggar thy neighbor trade policies. The Spanish story is, if the, if the Italian story is one of chutzpah, Spanish story is there's a British, famous British saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, and this is an example. I'll tell you the story and then I'll give you the, uh, the, the statistics on it. Spain, similar to Italy, Spanish public sector, uh, had a very sound fiscal policy throughout the, uh, this, um, uh, the last decade. He was up to the crisis. He was generally running overall surpluses, not just primary surpluses, but overall surpluses. However, Spanish banks, the big Spanish banks, were extending themselves, speculating quite heavily in the U.S. property market. Not just subprime, but the U.S. property market in general. Come 2008, the U.S. property market collapses and the Spanish banks are faced with collapse. The Social Democratic government, if we wonder why there aren't many Social Democrats in power in Europe now, we're beginning to find out. Uh, the Social Democratic government, generous of heart, bailed out the banks. It bailed out the banks by lending them, in effect giving them government bonds, which then replaced the valueless assets of those banks which had collapsed as a result of the U.S. collapse in the U.S. 
housing market. Okay, so the government saves the banks. Then are the banks grateful? What the banks do is they turn around and they say, look at this huge deficit the government has. It has an unsustainable debt. And so <clears throat> the, the only thing a reasonable person in the money market can do is to speculate on these bonds. So in effect, what happened is that the, the Spanish government, social democratic government, hands the banks a lot of money and the banks speculate on the very bonds which were given to them to bail them out. And so that's why I say no good deed ever goes unpunished. And to show you that I'm not just making it up, here are the uh, fiscal surpluses in Spain. The dark line uh, is the uh, primary deficit. The um, uh, light line is the overall, uh, well, I should say balance. The overall balance is positive. Using the overall balance is positive on beginning about uh, 2004, 5, 6, 7, and then the crisis comes. <coughs> this, um, um, let me move on. Sorry about that. You remember I went back here and I showed you the there is the, uh, uh, the fiscal surpluses in Spain, the fiscal balance in Spain. Here it is, shown to you again. The dashed line is what the, the Spanish deficit would have been if the Social Democrats had not bailed the banks out, or if the Social Democratic government had done as the Swedish government, conservative Swedish government had done, ten years before, if they had nationalized the banks. And the lower line is the deficit with the bailout. So the Spanish deficit is a result of bailing out the banks. It's that simple. Okay. I'm going to now move to the British case and I'll come back to what I think that ought to happen to the Euro. <coughs> I would call the British case the madness of Chancellor George. There was this famous film, you know, Mary, uh, The Madness of King George III. Well, this is the, the Chancellor in Britain is named George Osborne. And um, this, uh, this, what I'm going to say now is in more detail on my website. This shows economic growth in the United Kingdom, deviations from the average before the crisis. So the line there at zero is the average growth rate from um, 2002 through the middle of 2007. And we see that in only one period after 2007 was it above the average. That was the last quarter, last three month period of the Labour government. The next period the Labour government was defeated. In this I should, I want to tell a story, um, uh, an anecdote that was told this by someone who worked in the Treasury, and I'm trying to find if it's true. Um, he says it's true. Uh, they, um, uh, there was a meeting uh, at the end of 2009 <coughs> between the large British banks and uh, Gordon Brown, and the president was the head of the Bank of England. And at that meeting, it is said uh, <coughs> that they had a, uh, that Gordon Brown presented the bank reforms that uh, uh, he uh, planned to introduce into Parliament, and the head of Barclays Bank said, um, "If you introduce those into Parliament on Monday, 
On Monday, we'll close every cash <coughs> machine in British Isles. Um, whether that story is true or not, it's easy to believe it is true. Uh, and evidently, the story goes on, that the head of the Bank of England said, you should have let them close them. Uh, <coughs> but he didn't, and that's a point I'll come back to when I want to explain why we have this scam. Going into um, the crisis uh, in 2008, the British public debt, this is in current prices, not in constant prices, had been almost constant for about um, the, um, uh, I, I apologize, I, I've cut off the dates down at the bottom, but it should be fairly clear. Uh, what the years refer to. The, uh, as you see, that the, uh, the net debt was uh, uh, in the range of 30 to 40 percent of GNP. And both the, the net and the gross debt began to increase uh, rapidly as a result of the uh, crisis for exactly the reason I showed in the case of Spain. And is as the economy contracted, unemployment comments, uh, payments went up, other welfare payments went up, revenues uh, uh, went down. And in Britain, that relationship is much closer. This again shows the relationship between changes in the deficit and changes uh, and the rate of growth of GNP. And it's a very close relationship. About 60% of the variation in the deficit is explained by economic growth. These show the phys fiscal uh, balances in Britain, and now it goes back to remember what I said at the very beginning. There are three different deficits. The bottom line is the overall deficit. The next line up is the uh, primary deficit, and as you will see, uh, that the worst it ever got, uh, became was uh, six percent uh, <coughs> of uh, a GNP. But if you take the golden rule that you can cover investment by borrowing, then the deficit was barely more than four percent of GNP. A deficit of four percent of GNP of a current a current deficit is not a desirable thing but it's something that was clearly cyclical and could have been overcome. Okay. Before I, before I move to uh, a few points about Slovenia, I want to make one other point. Of course the British debt is not too large. The net debt's only about 60% of GNP. And it may well be at the current deficit is only about 4% of GNP, but financial markets are afraid of its size and we have to get it down because if we don't there will be a run on the pound and there will be a run on uh, British bonds and interest rates will go up and you won't be able to sell British bonds and the pound will collapse and the uh, <coughs> British imports will go up and so on, all the result of having excited financial markets. What this diagram shows, on the left hand side, it measures the monthly borrowing of the British government in billions of um, pounds, and on the right hand side it shows the um, ratio of the pound to the dollar and the heavy line is the British bond rate. So since the crisis began, the British bond rate has consistently begin, been below 1%. That is, the burden of the debt is calculated at 1%. That is below the rate of inflation. So the real cost of bearing the debt is negative. When Britain sells a bond, the public sector gains 
from it, it doesn't lose, and the pound has been absolutely stable. There is no evidence that the fluctuations in borrowing have had any impact on British interest rates or the pound. Okay, I thought um, uh, I should have done it before I got here, but um, I had taken the time to have a look at the uh, situation for Slovenia, where they're, um, uh, the data aren't in such a long time series. This shows fiscal deficits for 1996 through uh, 2011. Uh, the, uh, the dark line is the primary uh, deficit, and as you will see, as you see, for most of those years, it was two percent or less. And uh, now, while it is large, this is a very recent phenomenon, which is purely the result of recession. Now, people might say, but the real danger of this is it's going to add to the Slovenia's debt, and you're going to have an unbearable debt, uh, unbearable public debt, and that's what we have to protect against. The solid line shows Slovenia's public uh, gross public debt as a percentage of GNP. Let me just say, by international standards, it is ridiculously low. I mean, and now it is barely 40% of GNP. <clears throat> but the astounding thing is, look at the net debt. The net debt of Slovenia is about 10% of GNP. Up until 2009, Slovenia had a negative net debt, that you had more assets, the government had more assets in its account than it owed. I might just say, you know, that you're, you're like Norway. Right? Maybe not quite as uh, 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 negative as Norway. But why would a government borrow if it had a positive um, uh, balance at large? It's because what we, forget, what we seem to have forgotten, and I think Jan will be talking about this more tomorrow, governments need debt. You can't run a government without debt. There are many uses for debt. Uh, there are some obvious ones, such as uh, pension funds, uh, both private and public. They have to have a secure asset, which to pay off uh, if it's a um, uh, pension system which is based upon an accumulating um, stock of, uh, of wealth and then pays the return on it, then they have to hold something in the main. And the safest thing for them to hold is government debt. Governments also use debt for economic purposes. If, if you get a large inflow of, um, of uh, euros or out, uh, outflow of euros, and maybe the government wants to try to manage those so it doesn't generate short-term inflation. The way you do that is you buy and sell government debt. And one of the best examples of this was during the um, latter part of the 1990s when, when the U.S. was running a surplus and the U.S. Federal Reserve System discovered that there wasn't enough debt in the United States to run an intelligent macroeconomic policy because um, the, the uh, claim had been so busy paying off the debt that most, a large portion of it, more than half, can be held by the Social Security Fund and other institutional um, uh, uh, pension funds where there was no turnover whatsoever. So that greatly restricted economic policies you could follow. And it's the same reason Norway has, uh, uh, has, has debt, because it needs it for economic management. Okay, now, having explained that this is a scam, I just should say a word about the Greeks. 
Don't the Greeks have a huge debt? They do. Don't they have a large deficit? They do. When the problem manifested itself in 2010, it could have been solved immediately. All that was necessary would have been for the European Central Bank to purchase all of the Greek debt. It would have been a drop in the bucket. We're talking about a little country. I mean, it's bigger than Slovenia, but still, it's a small country. Its, it's debt was probably, uh, I don't know the figures, but I suspect its debt was uh, <coughs> smaller than many uh, 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 European companies. And European <coughs> Central Bank could have purchased it all. Having purchased it all, it would have then given a signal to the infamous financial markets that there's not going to be any run on the debt, so you can forget that. That crisis would have been over. And then if the Troika wanted to, you know, impose pain upon the Greeks, uh, they could have done so without generating a continent-wide crisis. I mean, to a certain extent, it is quite remarkable, and it will go down in history, I think, with the tulip mania. I don't know if anyone knows about the tulip mania. This was in the 17th century, uh, when there was a speculation on tulips in, uh, um, the, uh, uh, in Holland, the South Sea bubble. Which there was, uh, in, I think that was the 18th century, wasn't it? 17th century. Yeah. When there was speculation on faux property in uh, uh, the South Seas, <coughs> it collapsed. This will go down in history in the same way, in which Merkel, the European Central Bank, and the IMF, IMF is probably the least at fault, but still at fault, turned a minor, you know, a, the, a, a solvency crisis in a small European country, they managed to, con within a year, to convert it into a continental disaster. <clears throat> and looking at how they did it, I think will fascinate historians. Why did they do it? See, the reason I'm pausing is I've, I've hit my congenital 45 minutes. And I, suddenly I'm sort of like a horse that you know that, that that feels that it should go back to the bar, um, but I'll uh, I will I'll, I'll forge on just to earn my airfare, you might say. Um, <coughs> capitalism is a system in which the things people produce are commodities. A commodity has a twofold aspect. It has a use value and it is a exchange value. There's a contradiction between those two because the exchange value of a commodity is a universal or general phenomenon. The exchange value of every commodity looks alike. They're all in euros or dinars or pesos, dollars, while with regard to the use value of a commodity, everyone's every one of these is different. This is a contradiction. This is not a contradiction of the mind, it's a contradiction that you encounter every day. That contradiction is resolved through money. Money is the vehicle by which uh, it, I don't want to keep uh, uh, using Marx's terms, but he had such a powerful style in which he, he said that money is the vehicle by which the use value of a commodity is transubstantiated into its exchange value. <coughs> okay, so money becomes the vehicle which, by which it is, a, it is a claim on all use values by virtue of being exchange value in general. Further mediation between use value and exchange value is the value of the commodity, of course. I don't want to pursue the labor theory of value. I'm more interested in the contradiction with that, which the labor theory of value resolves at different levels. However, money has its own contradiction, 
because it is capable of being accumulated because it is the most abstract form of exchange value. So money creates the possibility of capital. <coughs> capital is the self-expansion of value, or, the self, or what appears to be the self-expansion of money. Money turning into more money. Uh, uh, Katrina showed the circuit of capital in the lecture yesterday. I'm basically talking about that. <coughs> However, capital creates another contradiction, creates its own contradictions, and one of the most fundamental at this level is in its expansion, at the aggregate level, it is obvious <coughs> that Capital can only expand by the amount of surplus value produced. However, individual units of capital if they were restricted to that same rule, capitalism would lose its dynamism. Capitalism is dynamic compared to previous modes of production because it can redistribute itself among different productive sectors. How do you go about doing that if each unit of capital is restricted by its profits, as it were, as it appears to those uh, uh, units of capital. The way you resolve that problem is through credit. Credit is a mechanism by which that contradiction is resolved. The contradiction is, at the, in the aggregate, capital can only expand according to the amount of surplus value produced, but that rule contradicts the dynamism of the parts of capital. Okay, so credit becomes a mechanism by which you get the redistribution of capital. Marx called that the centralization uh, of capital. We call the growth of each individual capital, the um, process of concentration, and the redistribution of it, the centralization of capital. It's a little bit confusing because we tend to use uh, the term sort of in the reverse now, but I'll continue to use uh, Mar Marx's terms. Credit is an abstraction from money. Credit is the abstract form of money. Money was the abstract form of exchange value and which arose because of the contradiction between use value and exchange value. Then with credit, we get more abstract forms uh, of credit. Derivatives, uh, you know, the, the more obvious ones are uh, bonds, private bonds, equities, collections of those, so instead of buying and selling shares in a uh, Siemens, for example, you buy and sell claims on many different types of uh, bonds, I mean, many different types of uh, stocks. Then the property market, and uh, you can go on and on and on. This process of abstraction is inherent in the capitalist system. The regulations introduced by Franklin Roosevelt's regime in the 1930s, their specific purpose was to arrest that process of abstraction. Because what the abstraction involves is moving further and further away from production. So when people talk about the tension between finance capital and industrial capital, they are not talking about tensions between individuals or even tensions between companies, though they might under certain historical circumstances. They're talking about tensions between 
two functions of capital. We are now in an era in which finance capital has been liberated from the constraints of abstraction. It can abstract, create higher and higher levels of abstraction in order to escape from what you might say is the most fundamental contradiction under capitalism, the necessity to produce surplus value. That is, it looks like MC, M prime, it looks like you can accumulate more money without going through production. You just buy and sell and you end up with more money. Well, that's exactly what finance capital does. It accumulates surplus value without going through production. Where does the surplus value come from? Most of it comes from industrial capital, redistribution from industrial capital. But it also means that there, I mean, there are limits to that because, <laughs> because within the same company, you have both functions operating in any big company. And so, so you reach a limit to which you can steal from yourself. Then your predatory instincts must turn elsewhere. And the, else, the first elsewhere is to the working class. And so you push down the standard of living in order, having redistributed industrial profit to financial profit, then you then begin to redistribute wages to uh, financial profit. But there's a limit to that because people do have to live and eat and so on and they, uh, they can revolt and uh, cause other difficulties. Then you turn on the state and redistribute from my perspective, and I'm uh, going to it in the question and answer period, the state is funded from surplus value. The taxes we observe are basically drawn from surplus value. Finance capital wants it back. And that's what we're observing. So we are <laughs> when in the apocryphal story, when Gordon Brown said, well, I'll reconsider things, when he was threatened by financial capital. Uh, when in the United States, the big banks who in 2008 had resigned themselves to a major change in financial regulation, when they discovered that it hadn't happened, they realized if they could get away with the great crisis of 2008, they could get away with anything. And what they want to get away with now is the destruction of the welfare state. And the vehicle for doing that has to be the repression of the popular will. And we have seen it in a very vulgar form in Greece and Italy where you have unelected governments. How long has it been since there was an unelected government in Italy? Not since the US occupation. How long in Greece? Not since the military coup of an earlier generation. These are anti-democratic measures with the discrediting of social democracy in Greece, Italy, Spain. It is, as many people have said, the right that takes advantage of this. And that's why we have to seriously consider that we're looking at the rise of Euro-fascism, which can serve, while extreme, can serve the interests of, the fin of, the fin of financial capital 
in rolling back the welfare state. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor, for your uh, enlightening lecture. Uh, I'm sure that you have a lot of questions and comments, so uh, uh, please uh, ask. We have plenty of time to discuss. Anyone? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, no. John, should I stand up so you can hear? Uh, John, I, I agree very much with everything that you've said. You've given a very lucid account of why the, uh, uh, how the crisis is a false crisis. It's a false crisis because uh, uh, certain uh, indicators were put forward as being the indicators of financial health and then when governments didn't uh, adhere to those indicators, then uh, it was argued that the situation is clearly unsound and the government has to do something about it. And yes, behind it, I think, is a, uh, a, you know, the, an attack on the welfare state which has to be resisted. I would... Uh, um, merely want to add a small um, uh, how can I put it um, a, a small qualification to your final conclusion because your final conclusion was that uh, what the state spends what the sense state takes out of taxes and spends on the welfare state is taken out of the surplus generated in industry. And I would say that this, this is true uh, in, uh, in the case of an industrial capitalism where you, you essentially have only two classes, the working class and the, uh, as, uh, uh, and the capitalist class. If you look, however, at it, within Europe, uh, part of the crisis emerges because of the, the situation of the third class, which is the middle class. And you, you can see that in, uh, in Greece, for example, a large part of the problem is the, 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 uh, the, the um, the fact that the middle class actually have excluded themselves from contributing to the state. They're not an industrial class. They don't depend on industrial output. They're not exploited by capitalists. They operate, they operate in a different way. Um, and, it, and I think it complicates that picture that you put forward. But th this, uh, this is my, this will be a qualification and a question that I would put to you. And I think I agree with your um, call there, someone else. Uh, but to think about that, because it is true, the um, um, large portion of professional classes are not directly um, <coughs> uh, exploited by capital uh, in Europe. So, <coughs> um, so uh, more and more in the United States they are, particularly in the me uh, medical field. But it, that is quite true in Europe. So um, the, that does complicate the uh, uh, the distributional dynamics, and I'll have to think about that. Uh, maybe I'll come up with something by the end of the question. It's a period, but I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, Tony. I, I'm just wondering, maybe it's a naive question, but I haven't been following the FP for months now. Is, is anything close to your analysis of debt and how stable it was? And for example, the, the, the charts you show with the pound and you know, the stability of, of the bonds in the UK. Has any of that been published at all in mainstream press? I mean, have you seen it, came across a similar analysis, or have you published anything in either FT or Guardian? Or uh, there is, um, where I've published is uh, 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 two places. There is a, a Canyon, there's a web magazine called Inside, 
that's published out of Italy and it has but people from uh, the United States and from Britain and so on on the board. I did something on the, um, uh, the, the date on Italy uh, uh, is in that, though it's a bit older. Uh, in the case of the UK, I have something in a uh, journal which I recommend to people, uh, the Social Europe Journal, uh, which is largely social democratic, it's partly funded by the German Social Democratic Foundation. Um, the, um, but in the mainstream press, I don't think so. Do you, like in Britain, you, I, don't, I don't think anybody writes an article and say bonds are absolutely solid. And, and, no, no, no. No, it's amazing. Because it, it's, it's such stark contrast to what we read day in, day out. Yeah. You know? And even if, if someone like you can't have access to show the different data. Yeah. But you know, it's the, the size of the ideological war is clear. Yeah, but, but, but it's also a situation where to get people to operate in financial markets, you have people who, the, the financial press is about trying to get you to trade your portfolio in the markets. You don't say to, you, you don't in that situation say in the financial press that the situation today is the same as it was 10 years ago. <laughs> it's also, I mean, it <laughs> was just <laughs> Tony Boyle doing anything because all, all your advertisers yes. will leave you. <laughs> Tony, the point's quite valid. There, there is a um, leftist in a daily in uh, uh, Britain for where it's been given with Century, it's called, uh, called The Guardian. Uh, and um, there are a couple of journalists uh, uh, there who uh, might comment on it. Uh, I, Ha Jun Chang, is a, yeah. uh, some of you may have heard of, has alluded to this without going into detail uh, that I have. He, he wrote an article about the debt is not, not a problem. But the main, the most, the person who writes most in the Guardian is a man named Larry Elliott, yeah. and he had an article just a few days ago that, sang, that says um, uh, the, the current government's policy is terrible, but they can't reverse, uh, uh, can't reverse it because of the reaction in financial markets. By the way, let me just let me say this thing about financial markets. We're talking about a few big banks. You know, there aren't sort of it. It is not a competitive market out there where you have a lot of gray uh, faces that you don't know exactly who they are. We know exactly who the big uh, players are and who are making these decisions. This is large-scale financial manipulation. Uh, <laughs> with, uh, with, uh, without doubt, uh, and uh, the uh, so the idea that there's some impersonal uh, financial markets that you um, uh, that governments should try to placate is ridiculous, and the idea that a small country like Greece can make financial markets happier, unhappier, uh, whatever is just ludicrous. Three percent of GDP, and yeah. of euros and GDP. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, in the back. Um, <coughs> thank you for your presentation. Now, all, all the, all the uh, countries that, that you examined, they were all members of the European Community. Except for Britain, not Britain. Except for Britain and then the European Union. Yeah. Now, and with the exception of the UK, again, they're all members of the Eurozone. <coughs> Now, I know it's not polite to ask about alternative histories, but I'll ask him. So, my question is, how would you imagine our present now, if in 1991 there had not been a breakup of Yugoslavia and the wars here would have been averted? Because of these examples that you noted, Slovenia was the only country to be given a choice whether to uh, leave Yugoslavia and then join later, some years later, again through a referendum, join the European Union and with it the uh, Eurozone. Now, of course, with the breakup of Yugoslavia, a large internal market that all the republics participated in uh, was lost, and also a large international market that was mediated through the movement of non aligned states that was also. So that would be my question. If, if we would go back, somehow change the course of history, what do you think the situation would be today? Because a lot of Slovenes went 
uh, I'll be glib and I'll, 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 I'll excuse myself from this, but went, went gleefully into, into the European Union and readily adopted the euro. Well, I, um, I'm prepared to, um, as you see from my talk, I'm prepared to play the fool quite a bit, but not quite that far. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, I think it's a serious question, but, but I don't know enough to answer it. Let, let me see if I can answer a slightly different question, which might be relevant and put it, uh, put it this way. Is there a solution to the crisis that we are in, or was the creation of the euro just a bad idea to begin with, you know, and that uh, no one should have gone into it, and that it shouldn't have been formed, and so on. Uh, which I know is not your question, but I'll briefly say something about that. There is a solution. It's a straightforward solution. In fact, there's an, I wouldn't say it's an easy solution, but what could happen now is the following. There would be a general fiscal expansion in Europe, led by Germany. It has a relatively small deficit, has a relatively small uh, debt, um, not a little bit less than Britain's uh, net debt. Um, that would then lead to Germany importing more, and much of that would come from the European Union. However, that would not solve the imbalances because there are some countries whose export in, in their, their exports are not terribly competitive. So it would be much too optimistic to think that just Germany's expansion would solve everybody's problem. And so there I would say in a progressive union, you would allow countries to introduce transitory import restrictions and export subsidies <coughs> while at the same time agreeing to investment programs that could be funded from the center to improve, lower their production costs, things like uh, improve the ports or uh, transport system or training people or whatever. So I think it is possible in principle to have a cooperative arrangement in which the inequalities which characterize uh, Yugoslavia and certainly characterize Europe could be dealt with in a way which was not detrimental to the weak uh, countries. But I think the chances of that happening are zero, I regret to say. Okay, uh, pretty much. Uh, I would just like to add one, one small comment about the increase in, in Slovenia and Medvedic. Um, it was mostly caused by, I think this is very important, it was mostly caused by transformation of debt accumulated in the private sector into a government debt. Um, it, it was not, uh, as opposed to certain countries, it was not, uh, this debt was not developed in the finance sector, but still within the, with uh, failed investments in the um, industrial sector, which was trying frantically to accommodate switch to euro and sudden drop in the competitiveness of the industrial export, the strategy didn't really didn't really work out. So basically, government had to borrow to cover uh, private debt. So I think this is important to um, to emphasize this this transformation of of private into, into public debt <coughs> because we read in the newspapers or politicians talk about uh, every day how the present extent or scale of social rights and welfare institutions is unsustainable. But what is recent increase and that uh, the, the, the government debt will keep increasing if we keep the current extent of, of social rights and welfare institutions while the, this last increase showed precisely the opposite, that the current mode of production we have itself is unsustainable and it, it leads into debt increase while there's nothing wrong with the extent of the social rights of welfare institutions. Thanks for adding that. I mean, I do, um, I think the idea that um, social expenditure is a problem is 
what a scam uh, I've written on this. Uh, what country in Europe has the largest social expenditure as share of GNP? Germany. Right. What country had the lowest? Greece. What exactly what you would expect? Germany is a social democratic country. Um, the, um, uh, Greece is a, is a relatively poor country on the fringes uh, of Europe. It would be extraordinary if that uh, weren't, uh, weren't the case. Uh, in Italy, too. Italy's social expenditures are considerably less than uh, Germany's. Hard work. You know, the thing is that those Germans work hard. They earn their uh, social expenditure. <laughs> um, <laughs> The average working year in the private sector in Germany is 2,049. That's, uh, uh, that was the pre-crisis figure, that's uh, 2007. You can find it in the European Union. 2,049. That's about um, uh, uh, 40 hours uh, a week. That includes every, overtime and <coughs> In Spain, it's uh, almost 3,000. That is <coughs> over 800 uh, hours more. In Italy, it's 500 hours uh, more. Uh, and in Spain, 700 hours more. Again, exactly what you would expect. The lower the per capita income, the longer tend to be the working hours in, in the country. I don't know what it is in Slovenia. I'm sure that the data in, in the European Union, but I suspect it's I would suspect it's well over uh, 2,500 uh, a year. Being lazy is a, I might say, a luxury of wealthy countries. It's, it's not a cause of uh, being under, uh, uh, underdeveloped. Okay, uh, Anina, you were. Yeah, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the um, French election, election results, particularly in light of your conclusions. With, uh, with an expert on it here, I, I, I hesitate to, uh, uh, to comment. I think that um, you can't go wrong uh, defeating uh, Sarkozy by uh, anyone from the Socialist Party. Um, <laughs> the, uh, there are some that are better than others. Uh, so. Uh, I think the, the, op, the optimistic thing is probably that the, um, uh, uh, the United Left um, uh, received a substantial amount of votes. I think it was 11 percent, wasn't it? Uh, that, um, and one hopes that um, Hollande is thinking that he needs to attract those people. The danger is, you'll say, they have to vote for me anyway, so I'll, I'll go the other way. That's, that's the, uh, the worry, I think, that we need to have. But if there's optimism, I say that's where the uh, optimism lies. I, I think the France is a much greater uh, source of optimism than, uh, than Germany, because in my understanding, the most likely outcome in Germany is that the Social Democrats would in, in, end up being like a single party, but they were going to a grand coalition with conservatives, in which case the basically Germany's policies will not change uh, very much. Uh, <coughs> so I think that uh, I see France as sort of optimism, though I'm not. Uh, I try, I moderate it. <laughs> but at least it's a little bit of a source of optimism. Uh, Liz, I believe that you had a question or commentary before. I was just wondering whether the, the fact that Germans work fewer hours than Spaniards, uh, is this also part of the strength of the trade union movement? Even though the German trade union movement has had a pact uh, to accept various cuts and things to keep this sort of export model, is it still, though, uh, that you have a stronger trade union movement people working fewer hours. Yeah, I think it is. That's, I think that's the explanation of it. I mean, it's not like it was in the 60s when you, where you had co-determination and, you know, uh, that trade unions actually had 
some, I don't want to exaggerate, some degree of influence on the boards of large corporations, but it is, uh, they play an important role. So if there were change in the Social Democratic Party, then um, uh, it would make a big difference uh, uh, in Germany. It's not as if the trade unions don't. Have, Germany is not where it is because the trade unions have lost their influence. Uh, it's um, because the trade unions uh, supported it. Okay, uh, any other questions, or commentaries, or replies? Please. Yeah. Um, I have uh, three uh, remarks to go. In. Well, I, I appreciate a lot of your, your um, lecture. I, I'm only making three remarks for the common uh, purpose that we have. And that is to, to develop arguments against, uh, let's say, the, the enemy. That is to, uh, and on the first point you, you raised, that is uh, the, uh, precisely the fact that uh, uh, the presentation, dominant presentation of debt deficits and so on is uh, 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 really uh, uh, tricky and uh, with uh, many lies and so on. I would add something. First, that we should uh, 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 um, add on your argument the fact that the uh, not only the question of uh, gross and net uh, 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 argument, but also the question of uh, uh, comparing uh, the, the, the debt to the GDP uh, and the deficit to the GDP. The debt is a stock, and the deficit is a flow, and, and, and the GDP is a flow. It's for one year. So to, 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 to make a, a rate between the debt, which is a stock, and, and the GDP, which is for one year increasing of growth, I mean, it's also very uh, uh, something which is uh, completely to be, uh, uh, to be uh, discussed and not to be accepted. Uh, another uh, type of argument that they use, the, the, the kind of uh, comparative uh, the, the view that they, they, they deal with the, the, the state as it, if it was a household, bankruptcy, uh, or as if it was a, 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 even a shop. Bankruptcy for a state, the notion of bankruptcy itself. I mean, it's, uh, it's a nonsense itself. The, the state can refuse uh, and have the, the means to refuse to pay and have resources, fiscal resources and assets. So the, the idea that a country uh, is in bank bankruptcy, something uh, which uh, uh, tries to push people to be afraid of the situation and guilty of it. A second remark, um, you, you, uh, you say uh, very rightly that uh, the, the debt uh, for a, a, a state uh, is something necessary and useful. And I agree with the argument. The only thing is that I think it's not enough. Because it is a part to, to, uh, of an argument against the way they present the, 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 the debt crisis. But then we, we should not stop there, because I think we, we have also to make a critic, critical approach of their debt. Uh, because their debt is not useful. The way they, they have been indebted, of course there is one aspect you, you already said, that is the bailout of the bank, which is one aspect of the debt. But it's not only this, because the debt existed uh, before uh, the bailout of the bank, uh, even if it increased uh, uh, quite a lot with the uh, uh, bailout of, of the bank. But the, the, the debt increased in the neoliberal phase, that is, since the 80s. Uh, uh, and uh, that debt was, is not uh, uh, useful <laughs> Uh, on the point of view of uh, uh, the, the, what has been the, the, the concrete content of that uh, debt. In the United States, it's the military, uh, military expenses, uh, uh, which is one of the aspects. In Greece also, there are military expenses, uh, and, uh, 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 which is one aspect for certain countries. But in general, in, general, uh, in France especially, it's, et cetera, uh, is the debt the result of increasing public expenditure? No. The, the, the public expenses have been uh, stable in the, in, in the uh, stable or decreasing. What is the, the, the real reason of the debt, before I mean the bailout of the, the, the banks, is the decrease of taxes. And what type of taxes? 
And there you have uh, uh, put, the, the, there are, of course, the, the, the taxes on income and the taxes on sales. The taxes on income, which, which are the most unjust, uh, or which could be the most, I, I, I mean, the, the, the taxes on income could be the most just type of, of tax, because reducing the inequalities. And it's precisely those taxes that have been dis decreased. And especially in Eastern Europe, with the flat tax kind of policy, um, so a, a, a very sharp decrease, 80% uh, uh, of taxes in, in Slovakia and so on, for instance, in comparison to 30% as an average and so on. So decrease of tax on income, but increase of tax on sales, which is precisely the most unjust type of tax. So that's only an argument that we not stop on the general idea that uh, debt for a, a government, even a left and progressive government, would be a necessity. We have also to put in question the kind of debt that they have accumulated. Uh, uh, and the third and last remark, uh, I agree uh, totally also with the argument that there is a false crisis of the debt. So that the, the crisis is not the crisis of the debt, in fact. Uh, and I said yesterday very rapidly uh, that, uh, uh, in, in fact, like, like it was said here, coming back to the bailing out of the banks, uh, the huge part of the, of the debts is linked with the recessions and, and the bailing out of, of the banks. So, and the absolute level, all the argument on what you said in the first point shows that there is no real crisis of the debt. Huh? Uh, but the debt is the result of the crisis of the system and the bailing out of the banking system. Um, uh, uh, and uh, on that point of view, um, uh, I think we, we should also say that, uh, of course, we have not to be to feel uh, any guilty of, of, uh, of, of the crisis and that the Greek people have to refuse to pay for, for that. And that is the key, the key question. I agree with those uh, points. I think that uh, debt GDP is a um, um, uh, yeah, largely uh, useless figure. The rel relevant thing is really the um, uh, uh, the debt service flow is uh, what should be uh, looked at, and it's quite small in uh, almost every country, particularly with interest rates so low. So I agree with that. And um, yeah, the state household thing is just. <clears throat> it's amazing how bad ideas can be peddled. I mean, when when I studied um, economics at, um, in the 1960s at the University of Texas, I would say I was told that that was absolutely ridiculous. You know, that, that, uh, households can't print money. You know, they uh, they uh, uh, they can't. Uh, they, you get this. You get intelligent people, and stupid people too, but you get intelligent people saying, well, there is a problem uh, with the um, uh, uh, social expenditure and um, uh, <coughs> retirement funds or whatever it is. Uh, <coughs> the government just doesn't have enough money. Listen, the government can print money. That's never the problem. It's a question of, well, the members of the European Union can't print money, but uh, the, um, it's a question of taxes. Why does Greece have a deficit? Because the rich don't pay taxes. That's why Greece has a deficit. Um, and uh, the, uh, the governments can always uh, um, uh, solve that, that problem. Maybe uh, politically difficult if you are committed to a uh, pro-capitalist um, uh, strategy, uh, changing the cha uh, uh, tax structure. But that is part of the argument uh, that we um, have to make. The big leap is to say <coughs> this crisis does not put us in a no alternative position. There are alternatives. The <coughs> we know what they are. We can implement them. <laughs> they are concrete solutions which have been put forward. You just don't see them. In, uh, you don't see them in the press because they are contrary to. There is the old ideology of there is no alternative. Great, thank you. Uh, I believe that we have time for one last question. So, if anyone would like to 
something? Sato. Yeah, perhaps uh, we could summarize all the cases you presented uh, also as self-fulfilling uh, prophecies. <coughs> if the trend continues, you know, and unemployment goes to 30% in Greece, uh, there actually will be a public debt uh, problem, which will be produced by the uh, solutions to solve a non-existent uh, debt problem. So uh, perhaps if you could speculate this time, where are we going if the current trend continues, if the current non-solutions continue to be imposed? That's an extremely important point, um, because um, I see it clearest in Britain, because I follow the press there, but it, uh, I think it also uh, manifests itself uh, in other um, uh, 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 contexts, uh, the, the conservative government, the so-called coalition government um, in Britain, with each bad result, you know, now Britain's in, uh, officially in recession again, with each bad result, they either make the argument, it would be better if it weren't, uh, if we weren't implementing our uh, our uh, policies, or they make the um, uh, uh, the argument, see how serious the matter is, see how serious things are. Uh, uh, that is why we have to implement um, uh, these measures. So the, f the failure, as you suggest, the failure becomes their justification for going on further. Uh, so what will happen? To my astonishment, one of the, I think one of the few bright spots in this is actually um, uh, uh, the United States and I have no explanation for it because certainly I until uh, uh, five or six years ago well until the crisis really until 2007 I thought that the ideology of budget cutting and austerity was much more powerful in the United States than it was in Europe um, and uh, certainly in uh, in Britain, I didn't think it was uh, uh, terribly, uh, 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 terribly strong. Though I don't think you know Tony Blair and Gordon Brown uh, were, uh, <coughs> were not very uh, uh, progressive in themselves, but they didn't peddle an austerity line. They always wanted to cut things, but it wasn't on the basis of that the government can't afford it. Now, to my astonishment, the United States is the only country that's maintaining some semblance of an expansionary policy. And it is a weak expansion, certainly, but it does appear that the U.S. economy will at least grow uh, um, in uh, 2012. It won't grow by much, 1.5% or 2%, uh, but the European economy will decline. I think we're in for very bad, we're looking at a a very bad uh, a decade. It's very hard to be, um, uh, for me to be optimistic. I hope the changes in, uh, <coughs> I hope Olan is elected. I, I think we can't take it for granted, by the way. I think, um, uh, if you recall, when uh, Royale ran, uh, some people say she wasn't a strong candidate and so on. Uh, but, uh, the, the French uh, right-wing press really turned on her uh, and uh, uh, in the uh, runoff, though she didn't run first in the runoff, <coughs> uh, and so I think that the French right-wing press will turn on him, but still let's hope that he gets elected. That might, you don't need much improvement, you know, if, if, if France stops cooperating with, uh, with the Germans, that will require, um, uh, I think, a significant change. Um, it appears that the right-wing government in, in Spain uh, uh, <coughs> is uh, going to at least break from the extreme measures that are being uh, uh, enforced upon them. So there are some, uh, uh, there are some uh, positive uh, uh, aspects. But um, the... Um, uh, I'm, I think the people of, uh, of my generation, we still, uh, it's, we are still under an obligation to struggle, but this 
in the 60s, I think that we had some pretensions that we thought that the battle, at least if it wasn't won, that the tide was running our way. Uh, it's been, tide has been running the other way for the last uh, uh, 40 years, I think uh, uh, we can uh, say. <laughs> so it's now your struggle to lead, I think, and I was very encouraged. That's, uh, that sounds lame. <laughs> I thought that that was inspiring many aspects of what the discussion this afternoon were quite inspiring. And I think um, <clears throat> that's what I'm going to go back and write about uh, when I get to um, um, Britain. Uh, as I think I mentioned uh, uh, this afternoon that my son is a trade union organi uh, organizer. I think I want to tell him about what happened here. I think that the British there are progressives in the British trade union movement. They should be aware um, that there are uh, progressive movements uh, in other, um, uh, other countries. The British trade union movement at the official level has come out against the, these uh, new pacts. <coughs> um, the, uh, and so there are some positive elements, but they're very strong uh, uh, negative uh, uh, elements too. I mean, the rise of racism, anti-Semitism, uh, uh, against the uh, um, prejudice, uh, tax against the Romani, all of these things. We're in a very desperate uh, moment and uh, we can while there are sources of optimism, we have to see that it's going to be a very difficult fight. And thank you for inviting me. <laughs>